Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and today I've got a great interview guest for you guys who knows a lot about something that a lot of us, I think, would either want to know more about, or even if we don't know that we want to know more about it, really should know more about it, and that is an expert on solar, solar electric stuff, you know, all of that kind of stuff to allow us to uh, capture this free resource that's falling down all around us all the time and, you know, use it for functional things. If you guys watch my channel for a while, you, you, I'm sure know that I, I have solar panels up. I use them all the time. I you know use them to run my computer quite frequently when I'm editing Praxis videos. Solar is a big part of my life, but I'm still a, a kind of a dumbass when it comes to it. I, I sort of bumble my way through it. I, I have been almost electrocuted once <laughs> yeah, using this stuff. So I'm still learning. There's still a learning curve. That, that should give you a sense of how much you should listen to me when I give you, give you guys tips on it. So, you know, as kind of like compensation uh, for all the bad advice maybe that I've given you. I've got a great guest today. His name's Reed. He has a channel called Manifestation of Imagination, which was my favorite Disney World ride when I was a, a kid at Epcot Center. Uh, and he's agreed to sit down with me for uh, several interviews to help get us all up to speed so we can all kind of be mini experts on how to do solar stuff. So, hey, thank you very much, Reed, for joining me today. No problem. Glad to be here. Although, unlike Praxis, I got to uh, learn all of my mistakes when I was very younger because I started as a small child. And I set my bed on fire once. So, take it with a grain of salt. All right. So, th this should be very informative to all of us, I'm sure. Um, so, the first thing I wanted to talk about in this video with Reed is... Oh, well, let me just give you a little background on him. And I'm, I'm not going to bore you. I'm just going to say... He's like an IT guy, you know, like the kind of guy at your company that you go to when something's not working and he always comes in and fixes it and kind of makes you feel like an idiot because it was so simple. That is Reed. So he's the guy we got for you today. Very, very knowledgeable, you know, bang, he has an answer and he's done. And uh, yeah, that's, that's who you, get, you have served up to you today. Okay, so first video, I want to talk about, you know, I don't want to go into like these giant thing, you know, giant inverters, giant panels and everything like that. Because I know for myself, when I first started, I, I started with a really simple system. And I think that was kind of a good way of doing it because of two reasons. One, it, it wasn't very expensive. It didn't cost me very much money. So I felt kind of comfortable experimenting with it, you know, hence the near electrocution. Uh, and if I felt like if I broke something, it's not like I was out tens of thousands of dollars. So I, I felt like I could kind of experiment with it. I think that's a great kind of entry level, give, give yourself a little bit of comfortability with solar, and then you can move on to the more expensive stuff once you feel like you kind of know it. So, Reed, what would you recommend to people as your first, or as their first kind of very, very simple solar system? Well, I've got a surprising answer for you on that one. So, for the absolute most basic solar system to play with it and get an idea to mess with is get a flooded 12 volt lead acid battery and a solar panel. Skip the inverter and the charge controller. We're gonna hook the battery right up to the solar panel and it's gonna trickle charge it. And we'll add onto that a car power adapter. So what it is is basically a tiny car electrical system you can play with. You can plug any car accessory like cell phone chargers, lights, fans, um, maybe a, a tea kettle into to play with. Um, it's a great learning experience because you can kind of see how much power things take, um, how quickly you deplete your battery, and how long it takes to recharge it. Because if you pair, like, say, you go to Walmart and you buy any marine deep uh, cycle battery out there, most of them there, like at Walmart, you'll see about 100 amp hours. Um, and that's just a measure of how much energy the battery can store. And then you pair that, say, with, like, a around a 30 or 40 watt solar panel. Uh... And because it's a flooded lead acid battery, what it does is when it gets closer to full, the acid starts to boil. It kind of boils off. It starts making gas. <laughs> Electrolysis takes place and sort of self-moderates. Um, and so it's sort of a system that you can not invest much money in, but play with <laughs> to see, oh, hey, this solar panel, if I run a, a like a rice cooker on this and... I use up all this electricity. Boy, it takes like eight hours to get me some electricity back to replace that and stuff. So that, that I think is a really great little thing to play with. It's just a battery and basically a solar panel to sort of charge it or trickle charge it. 
Then once you've got a pretty good idea of that, how that's working, you can get yourself a little portable inverter and plug it into it to provide some 110 volt power. Okay, I've got a question for you. Uh, first off, you said that uh, the type of battery you were talking about was a flooded lead acid battery. And I heard the word that the acid starts boiling in there. And the first thing I start thinking is like, oh, that sounds safe. Uh, like, what are, are there any dangers people should be concerned about about using this kind of very simple system? I'm sure that if you know what you're doing, it's safe. Get people up to speed. What do they need to know, what, you know how to touch this thing and not touch this thing so they don't hurt themselves? Well... Yes, a flooded lead acid battery is, is more dangerous. What it means is that the acid inside the battery is liquid. Uh, there are other types of lead acid batteries. Uh, you can see other ones that are called completely maintenance free and they're totally sealed. Now the only danger of why I did not say use one of those initially to play with is because uh, when they overcharge, uh, they tend to bloat and they end up looking like some deformed thing as they bulge out and then eventually explode if they're overcharged too far. Because uh, so, there's no way for anything to vent. They basically vent until destruction. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have had, like, you know, those UPS battery backup systems that you keep for running a computer and all that, and uh, it starts complaining about its battery. So you take it out, and it looks like some deformed, mal-cancerous growth thing because it's, like, bloated and changed into such a bizarre-looking creature over time. Uh, so you're not going to want to use one of those. Now, when the acid starts boiling, what it's really doing is it's off-gassing. It's making gas, effectively. Now, that gas that it is producing is hydrogen. And hydrogen, as we all know, is flammable. So I would not recommend, while it's producing a lot of gas, to have it put in an enclosed space and have a camp stove running next to it. Uh, you might get a rather surprising burn. <laughs> Uh, hydrogen, once it gets into the open air, the concentration of, I believe, around 4%, it's effectively considered explosive. Now, how much hydrogen can this battery produce? Well, you're putting in like 30 or 40 watts in full sun. Not much. Very little. It's, it's going to be some. So, like, if you get up to that battery and you put your ear kind of close to it, you'll kind of hear just, um, just little bubbles or something. It's, it's kind of a funny sound. Uh, you can hear it just kind of bubbling away. Um. And that's what it's doing. How, so to keep safe on that, usually when you go to the store, a lot of times you see these uh, in the battery section, they'll have these plastic boxes that you can put the batteries in and they've got a cover over them. And so when you connect your wires up to them, it can keep the battery nice and enclosed and all that. The only catch about flooded lead acid batteries uh, that's bad about them is because they release this gas. So like most everyone's familiar on their car, we open up the hood, we look at our battery terminals, and what is all this green stuff growing on these battery terminals that you gotta scrape off and clean up? Well, those, that is the corrosion related to uh, sulfuric acid exposure from the fumes that comes out of these things. Uh, it's the nature of these old style lead acid batteries. Uh, and so you kinda gotta deal with that. And then the other problem is you don't want your electronics, like if you get it, in, when we put an inverter on these things, we don't want the inverters exposed in the same space as our electronics because over time that gas will get in, uh, sucked into the electronics in most cases and then slowly start eating away at the circuits. And then we end up with uh, destroyed electronics, obviously. The ideal thing to do as we grow a solar system and you get comfortable with this is you plan to make a battery box. And that is a box that encloses and holds all the, the batteries, but it has a vent to the outside. So if you, your batteries are inside in like a garage or whatever, most people run like a PVC pipe out of the battery box that goes to a vent to get all the gas outside of the house. That, that makes me think about the idea of, you know, winter's coming and, uh, you know, what, what temperature do you want to keep these batteries at? You know, if they need to be venting outside, I've always been told batteries like to live in t-shirt weather. What is your sense on what kind of temperature you should keep these batteries at? Best temperature for a battery is 77 degrees Fahrenheit for lead acid. The, now, as it gets warmer, what it's gonna, what it does is it just causes the acid to boil off faster. So like if you, the hotter it gets, I mean, there's a upper limit obviously, you know, but even at hundred degree heat, you're just gonna boil off a lot more acid and uh, it changes the capacity slightly. Now it's not a bad, too much of a thing. Now on the reverse side, 
uh, if a battery is discharged, a lead acid battery, that means what happens is inside the chemical reaction, that what was acid is now mostly water. So if you've discharged your battery and it's winter and it's cold, it can freeze. If it freezes solid, do not, under any circumstances, attempt to charge that battery. Very bad things happen. Usually what you see happens is you see uh, the case crack and acid leaks everywhere. At the worst case, you end up with fires. Okay, okay. So if you have a battery that freezes, it's essentially no good anymore, and you just have, you can recycle the, the cores. Yeah, but, yeah I, okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it. And once it's frozen, even after it thaws, you can get it to get some charge back into them, but when they're discharged that deeply, you're just basically scrapping the darn thing. The lead plates inside of them that make up the parts that interact with the, make, with the acid to make the electricity, uh, most often will end up warped. You'll end up with them touching each other, and so they short out. Uh, it's just pretty much useless at that point. Okay. All right, so let's, let's just double back quickly uh, and just to give people a sense of where they can get these things. I, I mean, it's easy to just say, oh, get yourself a flooded lead acid battery, get yourself a solar panel uh, and everything. Wh where would you go to get these? Are these things you'd go to a website online? Can you go to a hardware store to get these things? Where would you go to get each of these elements that are in your very simple system? For the very simple system, we can get this stuff just about anywhere. Actually, a good place to go to is your local car parts. So you can go get yourself a cigarette lighter or as what's now called a, a car power uh, plug. That's your, what looks like the cigarette lighters that we can plug accessories into. Um, you can find accessories you want to play with, like if you want some fans and stuff like that. Um, you want to buy one, though, key point, that has an inline fuse. If you have any mistake with a wire, a battery can produce hundreds of amps, and you're effectively welding at that point. They're, they are dangerous on that. A uh, battery can produce a very large amount of current very quickly. So you want to get something with an inline fuse when we hook up to it. The now, so you can get you can get your flooded lead acid battery, your accessories, some fuses, some little things, and think of it as you're uh, wanting to build a, a little car electrical system. And any of the guys at the counter can actually probably answer a ton of those questions related to car power and car electronics. So your local auto parts is a good place to take a quick look at. Um, the, now a solar panel, some of the car places sell solar panels for trickle charging, but I usually don't see them in like seven or eight watts. I, but based on the size of saying like you wanna play with a 100 uh, amp hour battery, it'd probably be best to pair it with a 30 or 40 watt panel uh, from the math, because otherwise you're gonna end up, it's gonna take, like if you put a seven watt panel in there, it's going to take it, you know, three days to recharge. I'm not sure you want to wait that long. Uh, a 30 to 40 watt panel uh, can recover half of the battery's capacity in a full day. And you're not going to want to go deeper than half the capacity used. So a 30 to 40 watt's a good uh, matchup for that. Now, where do we get that? A 30 to 40 watt panel can be found Amazon. Uh, if you have a Harbor Freight, they actually have some around that size. Uh, Occasionally, I have seen little solar panels that are about that big at Home Depot. Rare. Very rare. Um, and another good place, obviously, surprisingly, for something to mess with for cheap, eBay. And yes, they are cheap. They're not the best made panels, but they've got two wires and they usually function. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a great starting point for people. If you'd like to know anything more about what Reed was talking about, uh, he has his own YouTube channel, and there's a link down below. It's Manifestation of Imagination. Again, remember my favorite Disney World ride. Uh, and he has lots more in-depth videos. Now, if you are terrified by anything that we talked about today, and you're just thinking, you know what? Thank you very much, but I would like to stay alive. Um, there are a lot of other options for you, and one of the very popular ones are these kind of standalone units. Uh, a lot of people talk about the Kodiak units, a lot of people talk about Goal Zero units. In fact, I have a Goal Zero unit, uh, and we're going to talk about that next time uh, on the next interview uh, with Reed, and he's going to talk about some of the, the positives about that, but there are also some negatives that you really need to know about if you're going to get into these really kind of quick, easy, you know, maybe it feels a little bit safer kind of uh, option that you can just buy everything together. So make sure if you're thinking about buying one of those, check out our next interview coming up next time. That's it. Thank you, Reed, for being with us and we'll see you guys next time. 
This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.